Mic'd up with Mikey Matuk. We got the boys in. I got Lloyd. We got J Mitch. We got Jackie Boy. He tried to jump up and he might have knocked it in. Good time. Let's go. What a start to the Monday. Oh, no. Liar. <laughs> I mean, I'm from Lafayette. My boys would come in and say, oh, 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 God. So I'm, me and Joe on the ground, I got Joe in the headlock. And he's sitting there, <laughs> Helmet. he's punching me in the stomach, like steady punching me, punching me, punching me. Here, and there's everyone sitting around, who here thinks Ochinko can practice today after having five whole beers? And he goes, Chad Jones, right? Chad's been the team. <laughs> Six for, minutes. For seven minutes, right? <laughs> Chad's like, no, nah, man, I, I don't think Ochinko can practice today. And I was like, I look back, I'm like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> I fucking saw you there. You were more fucked up than me. Be on the spirit plane had some issues i think she was sleep sleep farting you heard her or you just thought it was her I, just, I sat right next to her so. whoa what was that how to the show now when you do go to spring training are you gonna bring your chinchilla and your turtle? <laughs> My dad tell you about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> SEC is God. They hate fat people. <laughs> I mean, I get crushed for that. You know what I mean? And it's like, come on, man. Hey, it is, it's just the South, bro. You got a bunch of food down here. Yeah, like they, they they're just, all they're better just than them. <laughs> Players, look at. Lloyd. <laughs> you know what, Lloyd? <laughs> I mean, you're looking for a recruiting coordinator, but... coach. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'll piss my pants right now. We're wearing, no way. We're yeah. wearing gray pants, long gray pants. He goes, I'll piss my pants right now. If stuff. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening. Welcome back to Miked Up. Today is Wednesday, May 3rd. Uh, it's the one day before May the 4th be with you. Oh, yeah. It's the worst day in minor league baseball because you have to wear R2-D2, Darth Vader jerseys. They always give you these crazy jerseys. And then it's, it's a whole, it's a great day for the, the actual stadium because they have a lot of promotions and they get a lot of people there. This year just happens to be on Thursday, Thursday, which is even better. Oh. For minor league games. It's the weirdest day in minor league It is the weirdest day. Like, simply because, brutal. Simply because, well, the uniforms are terrible, but it's also to a day where you will literally see middle-aged, grown human beings dressed up in sword yeah. fighting on the field. Yeah, yeah. Head to toe. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's interesting. It's, it's interesting. Very, at a basement. That wild. was the one thing wild. that, so we don't have to deal with that. It's May the 4th be with yeah. you tomorrow, and then you got Cinco de Mayo. It's two big days in uh, minor league baseball. Cinco de Mayo is a huge day, uh, whenever that is, whenever that lands. So this this year, it's on Friday. So Thursday, Thursday, and then Cinco de Mayo on Friday. It'll be a nice time for uh, the players and the fans in minor league baseball. Uh, but we're not here to talk just minor league baseball. We're here to talk about all sports. Uh, today is Wednesday. That means it's Jay Johnson Wednesday. He is coming on the show at 610 
via video call. Tesla got a new mic. Tesla mic sounds very buttery. Since it sounds real nice. No more of the uh, connection issues, I don't think. Um, but we're excited to have him as we always are. LSU wins again in the midweek. Uh, they did not win the last two midweek games. Who cares? They win. They go to Southeastern. They win today. Or they won last night 10 0. It's their eighth uh, shot of the season. It is their 12th 10 run rule of the year. Uh, they have two midweek games left. They have 11 games total. So they're down to the stretch run. Three series left. They go on the road to Auburn. Auburn is playing really good baseball. We're going to kind of get into that a little bit, really get it into the in depth preview on Friday, but ask Coach a little bit of some questions about Auburn. Um, in other LSU news, Brian Polian has accepted another job as an athletic director at alma mater, John Carroll University. Uh, he was not very good as a special teams coach. Or the special teams here under his leadership were uh, left a lot to be desired. He got he moved from that position to a more of a um, different type of role and then move off the field role and then move from there to another off the field role as the athletic director as I want to shout out to him for getting his new job um, whether he accepted that because he was told to accept that or because he accepted it because that's his dream of being an athletic director as Alamar I don't know um, but where that is, is it? where is that school I don't know oh, I'm not sure I'm not 100% sure where that is fair but <laughs> That's where he's going to be, right? Um, if, you had to, if, if you had to guess. I'm not, here, I'm not in the business of speculating. If I had to guess what? Where John Carroll University is. In one of the 52 states. 52 states? 52? Yeah. You count Puerto Rico? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> basically, yeah. Um, Are we going to let him slide? Yeah. I mean, he said it confidently. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. That, that, that's you know, the he, battle. He said it confidently. Um... What are you doing? It's on U.S. territory. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know where it's at. I guess it'd be somewhere. Um, John Carroll. What are you doing? There we go. Uh, Pennsylvania. Had a couple. No. Pre presets. Virginia, D.C. Same place as Indianapolis. Close. It's in Indiana. A very well-known quarterback for LSU is from the state. Ohio. Ohio. Okay. All right, well, welcome back to Ohio. Hope he has enjoys his new role. Uh, NBA playoffs are electric. Obviously, a huge matchup between the Lakers and Golden State. We're going to get through all of that um, throughout the course of the show. But the real reason why Wednesday is we enjoy Wednesday so much is because Coach Jay Johnson comes on the show. Is he in there? Is he in the on-deck circle? Is he in the dugout? He's in the on-deck circle. He's, He's actually ready to bat. He's ready to go. All right, we're going to take a 30-second break, get him set up. And uh, we'll be back with the interview with Jay Johnson interview and uh, in about 30 seconds. You're watching Mic'd Up. Actually, you know what? Let's go. Ask Mikey Mitch right now is brought to you by our friends at FCO Development. Okay. There we go. Let's give, let's give them a shout out, right? I didn't give the read to it. FCO Development's a civil construct. You read it. I didn't read it. Like, uh, about putting together the Ask okay. Mikey and Mitch. FCO, <laughs> FCO Development gotcha. is uh, a civil me? construction company that specializes in new multi no multifamily construction. They specialize in site drainage, site utilities, earthworks, site clearing, house pads, ponds, demo work, hurricane cleaning. That's right. So basically anything that is moving, getting a site ready to be built on vertically has nothing to do with mathematics. Like Mo Lloyd tried to say on Monday, he said he wasn't very sure. He didn't know what was happening with, uh, he he's not good at math, but. Um, I'm not good at math. Yeah, yeah but math, doesn't, doesn't, you don't need a, you don't need math. I'm sure maybe there's some sort of thing, but it's... Well, if Tyler any, works there... You're not, be, you're not doing any equations or anything like quadratic that. Quadratic formula. Yeah, you're not, you're not doing the Pythagorean theorem oh, or anything nice. like that. Like that. Um, and if you're interested, right, these guys are based out of Lafayette. They do a lot of work. They are uh, very experienced in the industry. They've, you know, been doing it for their entire lives. And uh, if you're interested and need any help or you want somebody to do a uh, project for you, call Tyler Leday at 318-229-5585. Again, the number is 318-229-5585. They are based out of Lafayette, but they will travel. They will come to you, and they are, they are very good people. They are upstanding people, and they, uh, they do a very good job. So our friends at FCO Development, Mikey, Ask Mikey Mitch, is brought to you by our friends at FCO Development.
Welcome back to Miked Up. It is Jay Johnson Wednesdays. They are coming off another midweek victory. Um, ten, is it 10 0 or 11 0? 10 0. 10 0 victory. 10 run roll in the seventh inning. We had no video because the uh, coverage there was to not work. I guess they didn't have internet. I don't know what was going on. But we're excited to have him. We're going to talk about a little bit of the game last night, a little bit of the weekend, and preview the Auburn weekend. Coach, as always, thank you so much for joining the show. And love the new mic. I think it's going to sound great. Good. good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Sound, you right sound there. amazing. You look great. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Um, let's, get into the, let's get into the conversation of the game. Obviously, everybody talked to you about, you've been asked about the Gavin Gidry stuff. He's been throwing extremely well. Um, I know you had mentioned you had three other, you had some guys you were de- debating on who you're going to start. Why does it go with Gavin Gidry to start the game yesterday? Well, he was one we, we knew was going to pitch and needed to pitch. And I have this thing about the first inning. You're facing the other team's best hitters. I always feel like the umpire's trying to settle into the game. It's on the road. And uh, felt like he was going to give us a good performance. And, you know, he could be a starter down the line, whether that's later this year or next year in the future. And so we felt like it was a good opportunity and really happy we were able to get uh, the length out of him of two and a third innings and 31 pitches because that allows him to be at full capacity, you know, by Friday and, and this weekend to to contribute. So I thought he did a great job last night. I think it's the best he's thrown in a while. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. You talk about the bullpen. You talk about um, having him available. This past weekend, we got to see Thatcher Hurd in a kind of a different role than he's been. He came in uh, in the back end of game one. And through two innings, looked really good. Seemed like that's that's kind of two start two outings in a row that he's looked good. and He's kind of had a feel for it. Uh, what's your uh, a take on that? What's your opinion on that? And, and can we see him in that role in the back part of the bullpen a lot more? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I thought he had a good start on Tuesday, also against Nichols, uh, four innings, one run. I think he struck out six. Um, was really solid. And then um, how we lined up the end of the game on Saturday. Uh, he did a great job. I mean, faced five hitters, got five guys out, uh, relatively low drama, came in in a big spot. I mean, with the tie and run and go-ahead run on base and uh, got us a big strikeout and then a fly out to end the eighth and then a very, very quick ninth inning and uh, was really, really pleased with both his outings last week. And I think the best is yet to come for him. Uh, he's obviously super talented uh, has made some small adjustments that I think are going to go a long ways. And uh, that's a really good thing for, for us uh, to finish out this season and moving into next year as well. Coach, you talk about big spots on Saturday. Uh, I point to one spot on Sunday. So you talk about big spots, which obviously inevitably brings a lot of big decisions. Late in the game on Sunday, you bring in Ackenhausen. He gets the out. There's a quick hook behind it. Obviously, there's a big reason, big decision. Not because of who came in and how it, what, how it all played out, but simply off of how little he did throw. Obviously, he was in there for a reason. Is that a decision you kind of sweat out, knowing that, hey, if this goes the other way, <laughs> it could kind of, kind of struggle with it a little bit? No, I, we prepare really well, and our players are prepared really well. So, honestly, it was all lined up. Yep. Um, Nate was going one hitter. Gavin was going two hitters. Riley was going one hitter, and Thatcher was finishing the game. And uh, the only drama was uh, we gave Gavin a pretty tough test uh, of getting Seidel and Pinkney out. And Pinkney was the best player in the country this weekend behind Dylan and Tommy White. So, I mean, they gave up two hits. I thought uh, Riley threw good to Williamson. I actually thought he struck him out, but they they called it ball four. (laughs) And then um, Thatcher bailed us out. So um, it was uh, all lined up. And regardless if – uh, Gavin had got those two outs. Riley was going to face the first hitter of what would have been the ninth, and Thatcher was going to go from that point forward. So um, nothing really changed other than we had to do it with guys on base. Um, you know, it, that was a that was a fun game, you know, yeah. from a coaching standpoint. And, um, you know, we just – once we had to go to the bullpen early, you know, Javen Coleman really, really picked us up. And then there was that spot. Um, didn't really want to send him back out after 41 pitches and a long inning. And so it was Blake Money. He was the guy that was up, and it was hot. It was the end of the order right there, and we thought he could come in and fill it up, and he got us a big one, two, three uh, right there in the seventh. And then from that point, 
for the first six hitters, it was scripted and uh, felt like Thatcher at the end of the game with his stuff. If he came in and throw strikes, he would be successful at the point we brought him in. And so the only hiccup was a couple guys got on base right, in, right. The, in the eighth inning. But um, that was that was going to be the plan uh, from that point forward. Through the course of these last two SEC weekends, you've obviously, you know, really the last three, you've won eight straight SEC games. You swept the last two weekends. You've won in a variety of different ways, right? You've you've outslugged guys. You've had you've had pitching duels. You've made the moment. You've had the you know games kind of in between to where you've had to have the big hit or make the big pitch. Um, this past weekend on Sunday, you ended up winning that Sunday game 13-11. That's the way it is sometimes in this league. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to. Yeah. What's what? Why are you laughing? What's so? No, 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 go ahead. Okay. What you came here to do? You yeah. came here to hit bombs. Just banged it out, right? So thirteen eleven. So my my question is like, obviously sometimes on Sunday, like you're gonna have to out out swing them, right? So going forward, going into the postseason, how do you not have to rely on that? Like, what in your mind? How are you gonna manage this bullpen to where it says, okay, guys, we can score thirteen runs. I'd like to not have to score thirteen runs every time to win that third game. Well, it's it's just it's partly just playing in the SEC. I yeah. mean, we're playing a top thirty RPI team every time we tee it off, and right. so it's just flat out not easy. And you're going to get challenged. And nobody ever believes me when I say this, but it's like whether you're playing whoever the best team is or the twelfth best team is, it's really not that different in terms of competition and what you need to do to win. I saw like a projection today, and it has eleven teams from the league in the NCAA tournament. Huh. Well, it might as well be 11 teams that can go to Omaha is right. what it is. So you're just going to get challenged. And as far as the pitching, and I don't know if it's maybe just coming from the West, like all these fields are like super small. Yep. And on, uh, and I think ours is one of the most fair ones out there. But on Saturday, I mean, the wind was just howling out yeah. at the beginning <laughs> of the game, which uh, helped us and helps us. Um, so it, it works both ways. So it just becomes about execution and, I thought Saturday our bullpen was awesome. I mean, they had to go six and a third and only gave up two runs and I think only three hits. Yeah. Um, so that was great. And then uh, each guy on Sunday, even though it was a 13 to 11 game, did something yeah. well to, to get us to the finish line. So maybe I just evaluated a little bit differently. Yep. And um, I'm very pleased with what those guys did this weekend. With the with the I mean you mentioned it and with the amount of talent that there is in this league and how much competition you see from day to day, week in to week in, how has it been for you and your staff really managing injury this year? Because you guys have gone through a ton of injuries and there's really been no drop off. And so watching a team basically be well prepared to be able to go out there and do that, how has that whole thing been for you guys as a staff? Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I think it's actually one of the stories of the season that nobody's paying attention to or talking about. Everybody talks about the injuries, but nobody talks about the follow-up of, you know, not dropping off. And that's just a credit to the players. You know what I mean? It's like a guy may not have had the role that he did at the beginning of the season. Like, I mean, Griffin Herring threw three innings through 20 games. And now, I mean, that's like three Fridays in a row we've gone to him to finish the game on right. Friday in the SEC as a freshman. We we're just talking about Gavin Guidry, uh, you know, really came in and was a position player. Uh, obviously, he was a good pitcher in high school, but we didn't start that till after Christmas break. And now he's closed out a game against uh, South Carolina. He's closed out a game on a road against Ole Miss. We got him in with a two-run lead against a really good Alabama offense, against the best two hitters. Um, you know, Nate Ackenhausen was beat up but came back. We've won every game that he's pitched in. Thought Riley was really good at the end of Sunday's game. Uh, Javen Coleman, you know, getting back, yep. massive yeah. deal, massive yes. deal for us right now. Um, so I'm just proud of, of the sustainability of it, of the team and the toughness. And it's like, you know, so what next pitch, you know, so what next man up? And, um, you know, we said it a long time ago is like, you know, how much adversity can we take and, and still come out on top? I think that only strengthens us going forward. And it should, our team is playing with a ton of confidence right now, as they should. Talk about Javen Coleman a little bit, and you know he's ex you've extended him a lot the last you know the last couple outings he's thrown extended innings, more pitches. Is there a limit to what you think that you're going to extend him at this course of the year? As he keeps progressing this way, there's really no uh, no ceiling or there's no limit on what you think that you can do. Maybe, is he going to be able to maybe sneak into the rotation, or is he going to just kind of be that long guy uh, out of the bullpen? Well, no, we have a plan for sure. Okay. Um, you know, getting. Getting that first outing in, he threw one inning in that 
day against uh, ULL and 16 pitches. That was on Tuesday. I brought him in at Ole Miss uh, at the hotel on Thursday and said, hey, this is kind of my plan. Like, we got to get you to 30 pitches on Sunday. Like, this is a key mark. Like, if we can do this, then we can pretty much get you anywhere. And he did. And he gave up a, a tough homer. Uh, but other than that, I thought he pitched really good in, in that game. But I said, hey, you're going to feel better every outing from this point forward because that was on four days rest. But we had to get that one in because right. we got him up to 40 or 41 this week. Maybe allows us to get a little bit further, which maybe it gets us a little bit further. And now he can do one of two things. He could come in in the middle of the game like he did, keep us in it, give our offense time to catch up. Or he could he could start as we yeah. get the pitch count. up. And so um, I'm really excited to have him back. I think he's going to be really key in what we're doing and uh, it just gives us the flexibility to look at things in a little bit different way, which I think is really going to help us uh, as we go down the stretch here. Baseball is a game of, 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 of habit. A creature's a habit filled literally from the top to the bottom of it. And obviously when baseball and baseball, when you find success, a lot of times you try to keep to the same things that you're doing. It's very, very clear. Like we had Malazzo in here on Monday and the guys that we've had in here that have talked in the past – have talked about how close knit this team is this year. Is there anything that you've done from your standpoint, approaching it and trying to get the message of how important each game is, how important your teammates are, how important all these things are to try to create the chemistry different this year than you have in the past? Well, it's that's coaching, you know, and that's leadership, you know. And so I don't think you can get upset with players if you don't have them prepared to do what you want to do. So now when you think about baseball, you might just think about that as a skill, having a hitting approach, having a pitching plan, fundamentals on defense, but teach them to be really good teammates and connected. Like you have to be intentional about how you work on that. And we've been very, very intentional in terms of how we've done that. And um you know, the other part is the player leadership, you know, and we've talked about this and it deserves to be talked about a lot is Paul uh, coming in with the character he has and being the player that he, he is, you know, Dylan with the player that he is and the character he has. Gavin Dugas, super invested. Cade Beloso, great teammate. Malazzo, great teammate. And all these guys want to accomplish something special. And, and really what we did, and it was the first day back in the spring, and I've mentioned this before, is we just took a look at all the national championship teams at LSU, and there was a lot of really good examples of super talented guys having to accept or embrace a role on the team that maybe they didn't want to. And if it was okay for – and you guys were part of that. Yep. It was If it was okay for your team or the 2000 team to do that, and they could do it, why can't we do it? And it's gonna, we're going to need that little extra something other than just talent to be a championship caliber team. And these guys have done that and they've done a whole lot more. And it's very genuine when they talk about it and it, it makes you really proud as a coach. And I think it's probably the biggest strength of this group on top of having really good players. Now, I don't want to pat them on the back too early because we haven't reached that point yet, but it's pretty clear to me that the 56 game playoff mindset has really hit home with this group. Is that something that you're pretty proud of when it comes to how they approach game in and game out? Yeah, for sure. Consistency. And I mean, it's so hard in baseball because the game is so hard and, and you fail and that the mental grind of, of really being at your best and and testing them, um, you know, they, they've passed a lot of those tests. And I don't feel like we haven't shown up ready to play one time. Have we played our best every game? Absolutely not. But um, they care and the care level is high and the want to level is high. And it's really good players, and they can, you know, adjust midstream too. Like um, if we're not at our best, they can find a way to get a little bit more out of it. And then I think last night's a really good example because I, I think the previous two Tuesdays, you know, losing uh, bothered them a little bit, but it was the response. Like I mean, that Alabama series took a lot out of us, yep. you know, mentally and physically, and and I could kind of see it in the bodies and the body language of the team. But I also saw this like hyper focus, like we're going to find a way to get this done and play well last night. And that's just a credit to who they are as people. And, and that has, uh, has staying power. And, um, you know, you can focus on the things you need to improve, 
when you know the mindset and the approach is right day in and day out, and that's what their tough mindset allows our coaches to do. When Milazzo came in the show on Monday, he talked a lot about one. He's extremely impressive. Like the, his the, the, his mind, the, his baseball mind. I asked him, I was like, "Are you want to get into coaching after this?" Because the way he speaks and how he does. <laughs> I mean, you've probably seen it, obviously. Like, yeah. I mean, just the way he goes about it and how he talks Call to the pitchers. His own pitches. I mean, he's he's awesome, right? And so he, and his personality is a plus. Like, there's I don't think there's he's probably the the glue guy in the locker room. I'd imagine, right? And so he talked about how special. You just mentioned the group of guys and the veterans are, but more in particular, like his competition, right? Him and Travinsky have been here. They came in the same year. They're competing against each other. You pinch hit Travinsky for him because you wanted the homer. Travinsky comes through the homer. He said he was the most excited guy in the dugout because he knew he was going to come through it. How do you decide on, especially now with, with Neil out, how do you decide on what catcher you're going you're gonna to start that day? Is it based off the, the offensive matchup or is it based off who's on the mound for y'all and who catches – them better or not yeah it's it's both and that, that's a great story uh about alex and totally authentic like yeah. it, he is awesome matter of fact we were in like a huddle and he said something i was like you know after you're a, a pro malazzo we might have to bring you back here as he gave some speech i'm like we might have to bring you back here as like the recruiting coordinator and he's like oh, coach, we'll be running this thing if you do that you know? like, uh, yeah, um, he's impressive, man. Yeah, it, 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 it's it's just like any other spot, who we pitch, who we play in yeah. left field or at second base, whatever, like what makes the most sense that day. And at that catching position, it's important because they touch the ball every single pitch. So some of it's our hitting matchup against the other pitcher. Some of it's maybe who catches somebody, you know, maybe a little bit better. Maybe it's I want offense early, defense yeah. late. Um, it, it all kind of goes together, but you know, you mentioned those two and obviously with Brady, who's super talented, I'm, I'm super comfortable with all of them. And, uh, I think our pitchers would tell you, like, they literally don't mind who's behind the plate and they, they trust them and they've all done a really good job and, uh, they're all capable of, of being a starter. And I look at all of them as starters and, um, their attitude has, has helped them all be successful and help us win. And, and that's awesome. You mentioned a little bit about uh, trying to take advantage of the midweek games after a, kind of, I guess, a two-game schneid, if you want to take that. I wouldn't call it that after you sweep back-to-back SEC series. But we had somebody in the chat say that they showed up in droves in Hammond, Louisiana, to come see LSU play. Is there something to that when you go on the road and you see teams that are, or at least opposing fans that are going in and you see the juice in the ballpark to where it maybe gives your guys a little bit extra edge where you're like, okay, this does matter as opposed to a series where it's like, all right, it's Tuesday, we have to take the bus to Hammond. Like, it, it'd be easy to write it off, but when you see the amount of juice in the ballpark, is that something that your players take note of? You know, it, I actually brought that up to them last night. Like, you know, we play in front of big crowds every weekend, and but I was like, hey, look around at this for a second. Like, all these people came to see you, mm -hmm. and very few times in your life is that really, like, the case. And so, like... You know, let's let's utilize that, and um, and they did. We played very well last night. Um, as far as the home, I don't think we had a lack of effort. You know, right. the previous two weeks, I, I feel like Nichols played a, a special game on defense. Uh, they a couple pitchers, you know, gave them everything they can, could. They got a couple clutch hits and uh, deserved to win. You know, and UL, I mean, they used two starting pitchers, and they're a really good team. You know, and um, you know, we had some guys out and this and that. So I think it's kind of disrespectful to say after that. It's no big deal. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's kind of disrespectful to say, like, we weren't ready to play it. And that's not ever the case with our team. Like, you know, the game's hard. And, right. But they, they responded in a good way last night. And that was an awesome environment. The one thing I didn't tell them is, uh, you know, J.R. Teagues, the AD at Southeastern Louisiana, is on the NCAA championship committee. Oh. And so, I mean, it, it's a – first person impression our team got to make last night and i didn't really want to change or add anything to the game but he sent me a nice text after the game and you know basically like your your guys are as advertised which is is a great thing yeah, you know nice. for somebody that's in that room that put eyes on us in a real game and so i thought that was a, a real positive thing about last night's game speaking of that room speaking of the postseason there's only 11 games left in the regular season you have three series left y'all go to on the road to auburn Right, Auburn is a returning College World Series team from last year. They started the season all a little tough. Now they're playing really good baseball. They just went to South Carolina, took the series. 
You go and clear that at home. It seems like they are playing. I don't want to call them desperate, but they're playing for their playoffs, live their postseason lives. They're seeding. They're trying to get back in there, trying to make a run back into the postseason. Um, I know you're diving into the scouting reports. It's only Wednesday. You have the rest of the week. What do you see so far from Auburn? Like, what's the challenge that they bring? Obviously, you're going on the road, so that's always a challenge, even though you have been really good on the road. But what do they do that, that pose issues to y'all? Yeah, really good lineup. And, and you said it, Mikey, they're playing very good right now. Um, they have a, a hitter named Bobby Pierce. I feel like he's like 25 years old because <laughs> I recruited him like five years ago at Arizona. Uh, <laughs> not, like, not just the last year. Like, right, right. <laughs> So he's a good player. Uh, I feel like some guys get more attention, but he's super dangerous. Hit a few home runs last weekend. Ike Irish is one of the best uh, freshmen in the country. Ware has really good numbers um Stanfield like they have a really really good lineup and a lot of guys that can hurt you uh that typically play well at home and as you said you know it's a it's a lot of guys that that have Omaha experience and and you throw in the edge of hey you, you got kind of got to do it and that can happen to anybody in the SEC at any time uh based on the competition but it should be a fun weekend yep. literally the rest of these three weekends we have left are going to be they're all going to be exactly like the ones that that we've had you have to play well to win one game in the weekend and you have to play really well to win two and you have to have a great weekend to win three so um should be just like all the rest of them um it'll be a good competitive battle it's a, a team that i also think is capable of making a deep run in the postseason so we'll get their best shot and and that will make us better as we go forward um as you're looking at the season that's been played on the whole already i thought there was a, a maybe a 10 or so game stretch where the team was pretty hot early on um you guys have found a way to get it done throughout what has been so far the schedule right now as you're going into the back end of this thing how do you feel about the outlook of where you are where you guys are getting health wise how you guys are playing every day and at the end of the day we all know you don't have to be the best team but being the hottest team really matters how does how do you feel about where things are going right now yeah i think um I think the message that we've preached is, is preparation and consistency. And I think postseason success comes down to, can you make those games just like a regular game? And it, but if I look at it a different way, if you approach a regular game, like a postseason game, then you don't have to change anything when you get to the postseason. And so I think that is a mental advantage our team has is they've shown up every single game. And so I'm uh, I'm excited about that, and um, as far as the play, we're always trying to get a little bit better. It might be a, a bunning game. Like last night on the bases, we advanced on a ball in the dirt three times. It led to three runs, and those runs could become invaluable if that's like in a postseason right. environment. And so we're staying on top of that. You know, there's still things with personnel we're like kind of trying to sort out, and that's a day to day thing with college baseball. So um, I feel really good about it. I know our players. They just know it's about baseball. Like those postseason games, it's not about anything but baseball. Can we play really good baseball and play in character, play in our character as a team with really good fundamentals and highly competitive? And they trust themselves to do that. So the best part is we just need to be ourselves. And that, that's a really good place to have peace of mind going into games that, that really, really matter. Coach, I appreciate your time. One more question before I let you go. Um... We talked about injuries and we talked about the back end of the season, but guys are starting to get healthy. How great is it to have Paxton clean back? He comes in, hits a home run. He's kind of getting back in the mix. You start outside of the guys who are seriously injured and aren't coming back. The other guys are starting to make their way back into the field, just, to, just giving you more depth and giving you more guys that – more options. How good is it to see him back on the field? Because, you know, you've mentioned on here multiple times how talented he is and how much of a di different of a dynamic he brings to the team. Yeah, for sure. It's like, and it's happened in, in the two Alabama games he played in. And then last night, ball goes up in the air and he's out there. It's caught. Like, yeah. there's no in between. Yeah. Like, yeah. he's a legit defender. He threw a guy out at the plate last night. Uh, obviously, hit a homer on Sunday. So, it really, really helps. And, um, you know, with that being said, I think Brady Gilbert has done a great job. Yeah. I think Josh Pearson's done a great job. Like, I'm really comfortable playing any of those guys. It just kind of depends on the day, the matchup you know, who's hot. It's just like, it's not yeah. one against the other, just what makes sense for, for that day. But Paxson's a really good player and helps our dynamic as a team. The thing that's great to have about him is you could start him and feel great about it. He can pinch run. He can play defense. 
Uh, he can drive a baseball. So he can impact any game whenever he comes into the game. So that's a nice bullet for us to have ready to roll. Coach, I don't know if you knew, but the LSU Gold <laughs> Series is out for the LSU baseball team. And one in particular moment caught my attention from you. You showed a little bit of fire after the Texas Series. I was just wondering if you knew that the cameras were on after that happened. <laughs> What are you talking about? Well, you, gave, you gave the whole team a let's fucking go into the middle of the huddle and they had to bring it out. You know, if, if you really knew me, that you wouldn't be as surprised as that. No, I don't. I'm very uh-huh. aware. Get yeah. to know him better, I, I, Yeah, I mean, with with the players and the staff, I mean, that's that's the trust tree. So, Absolutely. you know, everybody on the outside, like, you know, they want me to lose my crap and go crazy on the umpire but at the end of the day like while the game's going on i have to make really good decisions but these guys they they play hard man and they care a lot and as a coach can't ask for much more so uh you know when they when they step up and do it like that at the most important times like i'm gonna get excited with them now they wanted me to do it on saturday night because that was a great comeback against alabama and i said no we got to get ready to play tomorrow but then after a tough win on on Sunday. I gave it to him again. There you go. So. There you go. Love that. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, uh, speaking of, you talk about making tactical decisions, Coach. Like, what did, are you playing forty chess with these challenges? What are we doing? What are we doing here? I mean, that you got one. That one. Jesus. I'm just talking about whatever you go and you. I don't know if you're doing it to take a tactical advantage where you know you're going to lose the challenge, but you want to tell. Oh, oh, oh my God. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Oh. I think you're one for twelve. I think you said something about chess. Like I, I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, 4D chess. You're playing a different you're a mental game. I have no idea what that even means. <laughs> Me either. Me either. Me either. Yeah. So so yeah, we'll talk about that. So I'll give you one as an example. Like. Jordan Thompson hit a foul ball at Ole Miss that was probably foul. But if they say it was fair, that's a run. Like, that that's like, for me, it was worth it if, hey, maybe we didn't see it right or they look at it and then change it. I mean, if we don't challenge it, it's just, what, strike two? Like, I mean, you might as well, like, go for it. There was one, and I don't remember who it was against. I believe it was against Kentucky, where I knew we weren't going to win but I needed a little bit more time for who was warming up in the bullpen. Like they were coming in the game. Yeah. So by having them, you know, challenge, it gave us a, a warm up. There was one where I wanted to disrupt the uh, rhythm of the opposing pitcher. So there's a lot more going on sometimes. And then some, it's, it's just late in the game and you can't take them with you. It's kind of like a basketball <laughs> coach. Coach out, don't, so you might, don't you give might that well nugget use. of gamesmanship away now. Hey, get that in there. <laughs> I don't know that the whole country is watching mic'd up, but hopefully, uh, hopefully eventually, hopefully eventually, but that's good. I mean, that's strategic and that's kind of what we thought. We just, you know, Lloyd wanted to yeah. ask you cause you know, he was, that's what he predicted. So he, you've, you, you very, fueled his ego a little bit right there. Yeah, yeah, I'm sitting I think very he's close right. to the dugout now. Yeah. Coach, I'm picking up on his time. So you gotta watch out. I feel bad for you too. Cause you have to see him that close to the dugout sometimes. I don't know if you like that. Yeah, no, that's a little odd. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, Coach. I'm with you. Me too. I didn't ask for any of yep. this. Coach, look, I appreciate you, as always, coming on here. Enjoy the weekend. Good luck this weekend. Uh, and we'll follow up next week. And then uh, I actually will be in Hoover. So we'll see you out in Hoover when I get to the SC tournament. So good luck this weekend. Talk to you next week. All right, sounds good. Right. Have a good night. Yeah, me too. Appreciate it. I did watch my media pass, so I need a new one. Oh, Can't get one. You Can't gotta, get right. You're gonna have to, we're going to have to go through uh, – Bill. Yeah, because they don't have them. They don't have extras there. I know. Found I, out I, last weekend. I, I, me as well. I went and talked to the people at the window, and uh, they don't help. No, no, oh, no. They were very helpful. She was like, oh, "I don't see one here." I was like, "I didn't know if they dropped one off every game. I tried to play very dumb." And then one of the guys was like, "Oh, I'll follow you from the Mike Up show." So you perfect. got in. Anyway. Yeah. So you helped me out. There you go. And you helped me out. The show helped you out. Not the us. Show. It's us. The show's about all of us. Uh, um, for better or worse. For better or worse. Oh, uh, Jay, great interview as always. Um, I really like Jay on Mondays because we were the first ones to talk to him and like we don't have it it's not saturated by the same questions so we tried to change the questions up a little bit we try to keep loser you get a little bit of a dy- different dynamic from Jay with us than you do with a lot of other people you get the laughing you get the joking you get hey you're 1 in 12 and challenges what goes into that you know so um, as always Jay is great love that he's on there sounds great with the new mic I know you're trying to get the, you're trying to get the headphones on him but you know, it's okay baby steps Baby steps. Baby steps. But um, shout out to the whole squad over there helping us out. Yeah. And look, we've talked about this before. 
about the bullpen. Everybody's concerned about the bullpen, bullpen. And I've said, we've said it a lot, that, oh, we're concerned about the depth of the bullpen. I don't think the depth of the issue. I think you're seeing how deep the bullpen is. You're just relying on some guys that you haven't, you weren't expecting to rely on when the season started. You lost some, some big-time guys. And it's going to take some time for some of these young guys to kind of get their feet wet and kind of really get into the groove thing. You can have a few good outings, but you're going to go through some rough times. How are you going to get through the rough times? You're going to rebound, and you're starting to see these guys kind of take the next step. Obviously, Coleman's starting to move, progress forward. You just saw Griffin go through a couple of rough spots, but he's going to come back out, and he's kind of rebounded. Gavin Guidry, same thing. So the fact that he – you just you feel like the bullpen's kind of like – Dude, there's this, coming into their own. There's this thing called the war of attrition, right? right. Like, and it's going to happen to every single team. But as it's been happening to LSU, I, I would think it's fair to say a pretty high rate. You have not seen them really falter in it. And I think that alone is the can be attributed to the coaching that's been there, can be attributed to the talent that's here, can be attributed to the mindset of these kids that are being put into roles that they were not expecting to be in and still being able to – at worst, compete. Right. At worst, compete. Right. Right? And so w- with that being the case, you would imagine that if they keep getting these opportunities, they keep ascending. Next thing you know, they have graduated into a spot where they feel comfortable in those roles. You just hope that that's coming down at the stretch run of the season and into the playoffs, which it seems to be shaping up that way. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what he does with that yeah, you know, because that, like I said, we've talked about Thatcher is the wild card. Whether he's starting, whether he's coming out the bullpen, if he can continue to do that at the back end of the bullpen, I think that shores up the bullpen a lot. No pun you intended. A, no pun intended. It gives you a power righty. Out of yeah, I, I, I've said it before. I, uh, you know, I thought it would be in the Sunday role. It could possibly out of the back be out of the back end of the pen right now, and it's not to put pressure on him. But I really do think if this team is going to be as good as they can be and or really get the job done in the end, he has to be a vital part of it. Mm-hmm. I agree. And it's really look, that simple. And, and look, Jay even hinted at Jay and Coleman starting, right? Potentially starting as he continues to build up, which that could be another thing because they haven't had a lefty in the rotation. And, yep. I mean, I guess you had Riley Cooper, but like basically all year you haven't had a yeah. lefty in the rotation. So that could be a nice little change up. Hey, we're going to put this guy out there. Now you don't just get three righties. You're getting, an, yeah. you're getting another look. Um in the rotation, which I think is going to... Which is awesome, because yes. we even didn't think that was probably going to be possible right. for him. And right. for him to be able to be that far along in, what, 13, 14 months is crazy. No doubt. It's crazy. He's doing the Bryce Harper thing. Is that as crazy as Jay... Even Jay makes it out to be for somebody to return yes. that quickly. As and, a pitcher, yes. Yeah. And so, with that said, how much workload do you imagine he can take on? Well, that's what I was... That's why I asked well, the Well, he's, he's already exceeded what we said. We yeah. thought he'd be a one-inning guy and probably never be back-to-back guy. He's talking about... There is a possibility. You saw him two and a third last night. There's a possibility. Not him. I'm no, sorry. No, no. But you, he's literally just said there's but a on possibility. on Sunday, he threw like two exactly. and a third. Exactly. I said last night. I'm like, that's not last night. Six Ks. Yeah. Yeah. But my point is, he, Jay just said, like, hey, you could possibly see him in a starter role. I wouldn't imagine it's going to go out there as, like, the opener. So that's way past what we already yeah. thought he was going to be doing. But that's um, that's unbelievable because Jay even said when he first inserted him back into, like, the rot- not the rotation, into the bullpen that – he had some hiccups in his rehab. Yep. So for him to be here 13 months and being able to kind of go, one, it shows youth. Youth is great, great. right? But that attributes to what that guy's done and, and the work that he's put in to, to get himself back to this point right now. For sure. And look, I, I thought that he was going to be able to throw maybe like Jay even said, they have a, I think that's the most important thing is Jay and them have a plan. They had a plan when he got here. It wasn't just, hey, let's just see how good, how, how well he is or how good he's throwing, how much he re, uh, recovers. They said, no, no, we're going to throw you here. We're going to throw you this many pitches there. If we can get you to that many pitches, that's the next benchmark. After that, I feel comfortable continue to progress forward. If I felt like if he didn't get to that benchmark, it was always going to be the one-inning guy right. out the bullpen. Once he got past that and felt fine, now he's confident enough. Okay, you got 30. Now we're going to try to get you to 45. Now we're going to try to get you to 60. Another 15 pitches. Next four outings, that by the, by the postseason, he may be at 75 pitches in starting. Because there – and there is – got to understand, too, there is that – mental hurdle that you have to jump yep. right and especially as a pitcher see like as a position player a guy that plays every day and you get injured like it's a it's a different thought because not everything you do is at basically 100 percent effort as a pitcher every pitch you throw you are basically emptying the tank in a, in a way 
especially nowadays, right? So for him to go out there knowing that, hey, this is soreness and this is not hurt and being able to mentally jump that hurdle, mm -hmm. that takes a lot too. And he, what he's doing right now is it's pretty impressive because it's not, it's, not it's not an easy feat. Yeah. I think the bullpen, I think the bullpen's starting to shape up and it's going to be good. Offensively, like they're doing what they're doing. You know, Gavin Gidry, I mean, Gavin Dugas is probably about to start getting hot. He got three hits last night. You know, it's you know how it is. Peaks and valleys. He had a few games after injury where he was struggling. He's finally getting comfortable back in. He's going to start swinging the bat at well again. Um, that's just – look, Jared Jones went through a little slump. Now he's hitting homers all the time. So, I mean, look, LSU has a chance to have three or four guys. I'll, when the season ends, I want us to go back and I want us to go and see the predictions before the, before the season. How many guys are going to get to 20 homers? I think that was a question that somebody asked us. Um, to 20? Yeah. I think that was a question – Maybe not. It was maybe how many home runs do you – who's going to lead the team in I don't homers? remember if it was a question. I just – I think we actually talked about it. Yeah. I don't know if someone actually asked that question. Uh, but you have – Tommy White's probably going to get to the 20 mark. Dylan Cruz is probably going to get to the 20 mark. Jared Jones has a chance to get to the 20 mark. If the, and if they don't hit 20, I think you could see like at least three to four guys with 18 plus. Yeah, I mean you have what, which three, is almost firm. four guys with 15. It's firm. You know, which is impressive, yeah. right? So that just shows you the depth of the, the lineup. It's not just one guy hitting all the homers. Uh, but they're in a really good position. They're in a really good spot. What are you laughing at? Clean coming back also. Clean coming back. Now, Clean's not going to get 20. But no, that's no. A big, that's saying, a big addition. You can see how much Jay trusts him to put him in the lineup. Obviously, he batted and bleed off the first game of the year as a true freshman. And to get him back in a role where, obviously, he's able to run balls down the outfield, he just makes you better. And it feels like he's 100%. Tommy White escapes injury twice. He feels like he's 100%. You get Coleman back. feels like he's getting close to 100%. Ackenhausen's back. Ackenhausen's back. You do imagine Brady Neal's maybe going to come back at some point before the end of the season. And he'd be Lanyap at this point with what you're yeah. getting from yeah. uh, revitalized Malazzo at the plate and then Hey Dravinsky who just gets put in to play basically T-ball and be the hit last through batter. Run homers. Yeah. Just hit through on homers. I'm just going to run all the bases. Yeah. I'm a jog. You don't have to run hard. <laughs> you don't have to worry just about jog. It. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they're in a really good, a really good position. They finished the season out with some tough games, but games that are winnable, which is nice. You know, like you don't have to like empty out the emotional tank on some of the top tier teams in the SEC, trying to like you know, hey, I lose this team, I lose a two, you know, there's a two game swing in the standings. Um, this is going to be their toughest test, I believe, for in, until the end of the season. Is going Auburn. to Auburn. I think right now, and I, I, I would have to look it up to see who it is again, but if you take their remaining schedule, you take Vanderbilt's remaining schedule, and you take South Carolina's remaining schedule, I would easily take LSU's remaining no doubt. schedule. No doubt. I mean, Auburn is the only team on the, on the, on, and out of that schedule, I think, that is a guaranteed playoff, a postseason team. Maybe Georgia. I know they play Mississippi State. I don't really know what Mississippi State's record is, but I think – out of those three, Auburn's going to make the postseason, right? And, and you're saying that, but people have to also understand what we're talking about when it comes to this league. Jay told you, top to bottom, you're pretty much getting the same thing. If any of those three remaining teams were to get hot and somehow go on a six to nine game run, they're probably a postseason team. Yep. Like, yep. almost almost definitely a postseason team. No doubt. That's what this league is, yeah. you know? And, I mean, Jay said it. Like, they are the last – projections of the post of the field of 64 they had 11 sec teams in there there's only 14 teams in the conference so the entire so basically that means i think only 12 of the They're 14 texas and oklahoma very soon yeah i think only 12 of the 14 teams make it to the tournament sec tournament yeah that's basically saying hey you make it to the tournament you're in the you're in the postseason right and like it used to be that way but there's only they used to be that's only when they had eight and nine teams in the tournament now you have 12 sec teams in the sec tournament Right now, they're projecting 11 teams in the postseason. That's pretty outrageous. And that just shows you how deep and how tough the conference is and how impressive, how you know, even more impressive the season has been for LSU because they haven't lost a series yet. And I don't want to put you all on the spot, but what's the yeah, team outside of the conference that you would even... To me, it's Wake Forest outside of the conference because of how good, how deep they are on their pitching staff and how good they've been pitching wise. They haven't gone through any really any injuries and they've been doing a lot of really good things that way. So I think, and they, they've been swinging it. So I think Wake Forest out of the SEC is one that I'm looking at like, ah, oh, this team's pretty solid. And listen, dude, 
Once you get put into the postseason play, anything can happen. I mean, it's just – Ask Arkansas. Yeah, you just don't know. I, like, these I teams also, can play well, but also, hot, you don't know them that yeah, well. Yeah, I also think another one, especially because of how it ended for them last year and where they were, I think a sneaky one this year is East Carolina as well, yeah. man. A lot of guys on that team kind of came back. They have some postseason experience. The, the hunger from how it ended last year at home for them. And they've been on the cusp for the last yeah. few years. I think – this could be a scary year for them when it comes to postseason and them kind of getting over the hump a little no bit. No doubt. You're, it's all, it's gonna, you always have one of those smaller schools make a run in the postseason, right? It's been happening a lot recently. If Campbell's still ranked in the top 15 in the country, you know, Stanford is projected top 8, top 12, 13, 14, 16 seed, I think, or at least a host. That's what the last, the last projections from D1 baseball. So, like, they're, they, you know, they usually are pretty good. They're pretty solid. They usually have pretty good pitching. So, now, they're not a small school, but they're a school that really hadn't been on I'm the I'm just talking about outside the SEC because yeah, yeah. that's right. all you're hearing right. about. Right. And so, I mean, look, I mean, last year you had a bunch of these mid-majors that, like, made runs in postseason play and had host sites and all these types of things. So, postseason is a different animal. It's a different beast. But I think if there's one team outside of it that I, I really think has a chance to go out and win it just from right now, it's Wake Forest. I mean, they've been consistent all year. You know I mean? All three starters are good. Their closer's good. So, um I think they're the ones that are the biggest challenger outside of the SEC. I would love to see ECU get hot again. I know y'all are boys with Cliff Godwin. Yeah, coach I would there. love to see ECU but come play here in the Super. I would love to, come, would love to oh, see yeah. them come play here in the Super. Two I think they'll bring teams. that same. Oh, no doubt. It'll, It'll make no doubt. turn the new box back to the old box. No doubt. It's Look, the box is a little bit, not, a little bit crazier this year, which is nice. A lot of energy. K-Lady's busy. She is busy. Um... But yeah, it's gonna be it's the season. This weekend is gonna be fun. We're gonna go. To, we're gonna go to the SC tournament, which is gonna be fun. Which is a conversation that we should have off, on air, off air. We can have it on air if you want. But yeah, this is news to me. Off air? No, it's not news. What to is you. it? May twenty third to twenty eighth. You know, you can't go. Look at that. That's when you're you're caddying, aren't you? I'm not caddying. Oh, it's I'm member guest. Member guest. I'm actually I, that let weekend. Me check. Though. Let me check. But that weekend, it's that weekend, right? This is perfect because we're not going to stay there for the whole weekend. We're not staying there for the whole week. What? I can't back out of the, the, the no. The you're golf. not okay. The golf's on the weekend is what I'm talking about. The golf is Friday, it's Saturday, Sunday, right? Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Ah, uh, Thursday. It's a Thursday member guest. Yeah, you can't back out. That's fine. We'll figure it out. I was only planning on going for a couple days anyway in Hoover. I wasn't trying to stay from Monday no, to Sunday. Not the whole thing. No. Yeah, no. no, I was only going to go there for like maybe the opening round game. And then come back. So come in there for like, stay there for a couple nights, do a show from there, like on a win- on Wednesday, get there on Tuesday, maybe do a show there on Wednesday, come back, you know. 18th through the 20th. Oh, you're good. We're good. You're good. We're good. You missed it. Good job. Even so, even still, I wasn't planning on staying through the weekend. I was only planning to get, at least get through the, like just do the shows from Hoover and have, um, get through that first game and then come back. They win the first game. Man, that's fun. We watch. It's a big budget to try to get, you know what I mean? Like, that's a lot. What do you mean? What are you looking at? Me? You have this, where are you going to stay? Are you going to stay outside? I'll sleep in the car. I'm not sleeping in the car. Yeah, so. Not that's what I'm saying. I mean, you don't have to worry about me on the budget. I'm not worried about you. That, very, that's been very obvious lately. Lloyd, we're not sleeping in the car. No. 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 Don't I mean, this guy. So. Don't do that. We're not staying there for a whole week either. Take the party box. That's not gonna make it. It wouldn't make it out of the down the street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. Should we start talking? I mean, if that tournament goes well, are we trying to take this thing to Omaha. The show? I would love to go to Omaha. I told you that. I would love to do that. I already told Allie if they make it to Omaha, I want to go. I'll be there regardless. It's either gonna be at the zoo or at the baseball fields. We're gonna, I mean, I, I would like to make that happen, but we're gonna get to that point when we get to that point. Cross that bridge when we get there. Yes. Um, all right. Well, we're going to take a one minute break, get on the backside in the seven o'clock hour after what, why do you, why do you always give me the little head nod? You mean like the little puppy dog? Um, how is he doing by the way? He's doing well. Stitches are going to come out in like four days. He's not pulling on him? No, not anymore. That we boy. put a shirt, we tied a shirt around him instead of like the little like surgical suit that he hated. He likes the shirt. He doesn't mess with the, he doesn't mess, mess with the stitches. That a boy. Yeah. Good boy. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. Lakers up 1-0. Kobe. Oh, I see what you did there. They are up 1-0. 
Um, but we're going to take a one minute break before we go to the break. I want to give a shout out to our sponsors and our friends at Heineken. Heineken Silver is their new light beer. It's 95 calories, uh, 4% alcohol. It is the. Uh, it strikes it's different. again. It strikes again. The Friday Booze Crew strikes Friday, again. It's every Friday. You're doing it, baby, until he gets to the end of the season, right? <laughs> so it is a 95 calorie light beer. It is unlike any other of the Heineken's. Heineken Silver, it is on the shelves. Go get it. Put it in your summer mix put it in your ice chest when you go to the beach when you go to the lake when you go fishing when you go wherever you're gonna go if you're outside and you're enjoying the sun enjoying the weather drink a heineken soda because they're pretty good they are pretty good and uh they got the thin the thin slender cans right it's so like the thin slender cans it's easy it's easier to pack into an ice chest and some like the big you know long neck bottles or whatever so little, heineken silver little girth boy yeah heineken silver we're proud to be partners with heineken and uh if I'm bringing it, one you, to Alex Bot. Like if you want, you got to. And if you're walking by, if you're walking in the grocery store, and you see it, just go ahead and dra- grab, go grab a case and see if you like it. And if you mention Miked Up 15 to the person checking you out, you might get 50 percent off. <laughs> might, Mike? might is the keyword. It just depends on how. Good and if you, you are. say it with a lot of confidence, like you, like it's a thing, they may not know any better. Gotten away with much, aka work. demanded. Don't ask. Yep, yes. <laughs> um, that's right. your only shot. <laughs> we'll be back uh, in one minute on the back side of this. Before we move on to the other sports, I do want to talk a little bit about Keith Law. He came out with an article, and I want to get y'all's opinion on that. We've talked about the draft before, but um, we'll talk about that in the seven o'clock hour. All right, you're watching Mic'd Up. Keith, we'll be back in one minute. Chief Keith. Dozy Place is located on 3723 Government Street. Everybody knows about their Wall of Fame mistakes and their hot tamales, but what you may not know is that they're open for lunch every day from 11 to 2. Great people, great environment. Their lunch menu is fire. What's the best thing on the menu? If you haven't tried it yet, you need to try the burger. Unbelievable. Best burger in town. Best burger in town. If you're looking for lunch, 11 to 2, at Doe's Eat Place. Again, they're located on 3723 Government Street. Give them a shot. Those are your Heineken headlines. Heineken has been an unbelievable sponsor for us, right? Um, I understand some people may not like Heineken, and that's okay. Tell me that. Good shot. Heineken just came out with the Heineken Silver. And if you have not liked Heineken in the past, that's okay. Heineken Silver doesn't taste anything like the other Heineken beers. Heineken is their light beer. It is 95 calories. It is 4% alcohol. It tastes very good. It's very crisp. Sit back, relax, open up a Heineken Silver. Enjoy baseball season coming up. Enjoy the LSU Tigers. Enjoy some women's basketball. If you're watching it at home, pop open a Heineken Silver. Because I'll, I'll tell you this, and I'm, I'm look, Heineken's a sponsor of us. And I am very uh, happy and honored that they are a sponsor. I did not really enjoy Heineken in my previous times drinking Heineken. I have learned to like it a little bit. Some people like it. Tell you what, I drank this, Heineken Silver, and I enjoyed it. I've drank, I've, I've got a couple cases delivered to my house today, actually, and uh, I'm enjoying it. So go ahead, go try a Heineken Silver. It's their new product. It's their new beer. It's their new line. It is very light, 95 calories, 4% alcohol. Tastes really good. Try it. Thanks, Jack. That was nice. We didn't even practice that first time. All right. I'm back. Welcome back to Mike'd Up. Um, what? Point at me. It was you yeah, right before the damn thing. I know. This guy. This guy. Trying to get um, some content out there. We are... Um, I want to talk about this article. Keith Law wrote an article. What's, was, your, what's your opinion on Keith Law? Uh, he is, you know... A I, guy. Look, he's, he's a guy. He writes. <laughs> and he's a pundit. And... Sometimes he has good takes, sometimes he has bad takes, sometimes he comes off a little um, brash. And some people may rub some he may rub some people the wrong way. But I'm not here to judge him as a person. I don't know him to judge him that. I've know I've talked to him a few times. But he did write an article 
and he does what he says has some sway and he's around and in the know in the professional world college world and you know he starts talking about you know when he was scouting the teams and he's looking at it he's basically saying like LSU's got the two number one picks in the, in the draft, right? Either one one's going to be Cruz or one's one, – one one's either going to be Dylan Cruz or Paul Skeens. And he basically says you can't go either – you can't go wrong either way. But he did – when he look, he critiqued – you go and you critique one you, – you nitpick all the time when you're whenever you're at this point in the, in the season and when you're this good, right? So he's in there. He's like, yeah, you know, he came out guns blazing. Paul Skeens, he did. His last, his last outing. Start. Yeah. Um, sitting 99 to 101 the first couple innings. And then, then you know, he kind of dropped off. He was sitting 96 to 99 when he came out. Like, well, I mean. You're still touching what you started You're touching at. 99 and this late in the good. season, like, you're all right. You know what I mean? So, you know, he talked about how impressive he was. I think as Paul Skeens evolves and continues to grow and get better, I think he's going to start using that changeup a lot more. I think that's going to be a big weapon for him. That's going to be his fourth pitch. He doesn't really throw his break curve ball. He can flip it over whenever he wants, but it's yeah. more of a slider, changeup, fastball with a four-seamer with a two-seamer. Um, and then he talked about, like, Dylan Cruz is probably the best player in college baseball, and those two guys are probably the two best players in, in college. That has a chance to go one overall. He also talked about Wyatt Langford, who's a center fielder for Florida, and – He's putting up some really good numbers this year. He's very athletic. He basically says that Wyatt Langford as an athlete is the is probably the best one of the best athletes in the draft. He, he thinks he's a better athlete than Dylan Cruz is, but Dylan Cruz is a better baseball player, which whatever. I, don't, I'm, I haven't been around Wyatt Langford, but he's having a great year. He's in 382, doing whatever he's going to do. Um, but we've talked a lot on this show about who we think is going to be the number one overall pick between those two. And I said that it depends on where the Pirates are at that point in the season. Right now, they're 20 and 6. Really think I'm just going to repeat that. <laughs> really think about the it. The Pittsburgh Pirates are? are 20 and 6, which means they have 20 wins and 6 losses going into May. 14 games over 5, I, and we're not out the first month. I would not willing to bet they didn't have 20, lo- 20 wins over the course of the first two and a half months last year. Right. Right? And they have a bunch of young position players. They just extended Brian Reynolds to an eight-year deal. He's an outfielder. Um, I would imagine that they want to draft Dylan Cruz, but if they get to the, uh, the draft in July or in June, no, it's in July. When is the draft? You it's should know. June. Well, now. they changed it. It's not. It's not during the season anymore. They get to after June. the season. Right after Omaha. Yeah. And yeah. so Keith Law has some things to say about you getting drafted. Now that I'm looking it up. Me? Mm-hmm. I know. Are you trying I'm pretty to, sure he has something to say about everyone who went yeah, the first round. Yeah, that's his job. That's his job. I would, I would imagine that's what he does every year about people that he's grading the first round every yeah. year. Oh, he's, re, he's redrafting the 2011 class. Oh, I don't I'm care. I'm sure he's done that, I mean, sure he's done really that year in and year out, too. Yeah. Like, that's probably nothing. Yeah. Um, you, you're trying to get me, me mad at him? No, Dom in the rough. What? Did he get an ample opportunity. He's Is that what he complimentary said? of you. Is that what he said? No, he said you were the worst pick that they had and the worst draft of the Tampa Bay Rays in the last 10 years. Oh, thanks. Yeah, sorry. That's but but shout out to Keith Law. Yep, there we go. Okay. Um, Not really. He was actually very complimentary. Though. I mean, Jesus Christ, dude. <laughs> Figure it out. Tell me what exactly what he said then if you're going to say it. I can't. It's only athletic. Okay. Well, I already forgot my train of thought right there. Once again. I'm sure Keith Law did appreciate it. What that. was I saying? <laughs> oh, talking about the Pirates. If the Pirates, when the draft happens, if the Pirates are in a position to be to make a playoff run and they think that they are like have a legit chance, you could see them draft Skeens, and that's what I've been saying. What did, have has y'all have your opinion? Has your opinion changed? So the here's of my question too, and I, I'm I'm asking this because I don't I'm not a scout. I really don't know when this thought process kind of changed. But starting pitching has always been like at a super premium, right? When has it become that? the top overall position player now trumps the pretty much far and beyond best yeah, future number one best arm in the league yeah. in, in in the draft well I, and and this is no slight to dylan obviously but for as long as i can remember it was always like hey if you can find a guy that you think could be a number one or number two even though he's only going to throw every fifth day like it means a lot and it's probably even better than having the perennial all-star center fielder that's kind of how it used to always be for the most part and it seems like somewhere along that like that kind of has changed a little bit 
so I was like wondering, like, when do y'all feel like that's where the the trend is right now? Because that's what it kind of feels like. Yeah, a little me. bit. It's weird. It's just, uh, and I think it's a preference of teams, right? Like, it's no, just yeah, like, of course. But yeah. like, as I'm seeing, this, these are the reason why I'm saying this because I'm seeing this from different reports, and none of them are coming from teams. They're really coming from like baseball writers and stuff like that who right. are writing about what's coming in the upcoming draft. I'm with you in the sense of, first off, like we said, they've already re-signed their young center fielder. Now, I understand Dylan doesn't have to just play center. He can play left and or he can play right. Right. I get that. And or the same thing with Brian Reynolds. At that point, by the time Dylan's ready, whenever that is, maybe he can play left or he can play right. 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 So I, I completely understand that. But it's when you when you see a team that has not historically given out huge contracts, which we all know huge contracts for top tier starting pitching is always going to be a thing in baseball. It's hard for me to believe that they'll pass on one that they might have an opportunity in in what may be their window to start winning right now. Yeah. Even though you probably have a generational player in Dylan right behind. Right. right. I say behind it in that spot, yeah. available in that spot. Yeah. So like that for me when I look at it I keep thinking about man, like just knowing what they've done with contracts in the past and like I think last year when they re-signed the Cabrian Hayes kid he signed a, a very team friendly, like eighty million dollar deal, and yep. it's the largest ever in team history. Yeah. I'll say it again, largest ever in and team now history. Brian Reynolds is long and now, long. now Brian Reynolds is this year. So for me, it's like, okay, well then, if you got a starting pitcher that is pretty generational as well, do you pass up on him right. for another fielder? And you probably use him at the out of the bullpen if he gets in the big leagues that this year. year. Right? That yeah. year, but my point right. is, is you're not drafting him for just that year. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna depend on that. It's gonna see, but it's good to see the Pirates, the old Buckos. Yeah. I mean, it's good when they're good. They just you know, great f- great home time. field, great stadium. Oh, best best view in baseball. Great stadium. You know how tall the right field wall is? Nope. Am I supposed to? It's twenty one feet for Roberto Clemente. Oh, I did uh, I did know that actually. <clears throat> I did know that. Lloyd um, Nugget of the day. But. The draft's gonna be good. He he also Keith also said he thought um, Trey Morgan was a top five rounder, which sounds about right. That's he likes right. Jordan Thompson. Yeah. He thinks Jordan Thompson's got potential sixty, potential sixty power. Um, sixty. So he said. That's a high number. I know fifty five sixty. He said. Sixty. It's out of eighty, right? Yeah. Yeah, but like sixty is like high potential. Like you don't really see guys get to eighty on whatever the scale is. No, sixties high. Yeah, he had he had Dylan Cruz as a seventy potential seventy average guy. <laughs> That's big. He can um, come back if he wants. He can come back. <laughs> I mean, both them. Him yeah, and, he'll be back to visit in the fall. Yeah, him and <laughs> him and, <laughs> him and Skeens are both gonna get dra- get picked and get paid like number one. Yeah. pick. that's what I believe. Just stay after. I don't know, maybe the Appalachian State game in week four of the first quarter. He'll be on the field waving to the, waving. To the fans. Yeah, 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 yeah. About that time. That's that's when he'll that's yeah, when not. he'll be that's when uh, he'll be they, back. I think they'll give him an SEC game. <laughs> I think that's, what, give, that's I think when he'll, he'll be back. SEC game. Yeah. <laughs> um But moving on from the baseball talk, like I said, we're gonna preview the Auburn L S U series on Friday when we have we're back in the studio from one to three. Um, but there's other sports going on right now and that I'm enjoying watching a lot. And that is NBA playoffs. I know a lot of people don't like to hear me talk about the NBA playoffs, but I think it's fun. I think you have two polarizing guys playing against each other. Not polarizing. One's polarizing. One's just very talented. No, they're both polar. But they're both very yeah, polarizing. I would, but I would For consider, different ways. Yeah, and I wouldn't but, consider Steph polarizing because he's not like very out like there. in your face. You know what I mean? It's more he's a very uh, – he's entertaining. He's entertaining. That's probably better. I think you can easily say they're both polarizing. Just yeah. they're, They are – a lot of it is a must-watch television. They're generational talents. For sure. They've been at the opposite end of spectrums, basically clashing heads a lot. It's So here's my question to you. Jesus, dude, you know I'm on the show. It's unbelievable. People, <laughs> I mean. That ain't even people. Um, here's my question to you. You're watching LeBron. LeBron is going to go down as, they're always LeBron or MJ, LeBron or MJ, right? Greatest of all time. You know, LeBron's got four championships, but he's been there ten times. Which, that's crazy in itself. He's been to the NBA Finals ten times. And gets made fun of for it. Right. But ten times is crazy. Four championships, four NBA MVP, uh, Finals MVPs. Steph, four time, six times to the championships. 
four, I mean, six times to the finals, four championships, one MVP. Steph's playoff record against LeBron is very good. Like, very good. If Steph and the Warriors beat LeBron in the playoffs, go to the NBA Finals, and he wins his fifth championship, Stephen A. Smith said this. Who Stephen A. came up in the game as a basketball guy. He basketball said, player in college. Yeah, but like he—that's where he made his like as a as a uh, as a writer and as a uh, analyst, like as a basketball. He says, if that happens, I may have to take LeBron off of Mount Rushmore and put Steph Curry. Now I don't believe all that, but I believe you could put both of them on it. I think they both end up on yep. it at that point. Yeah. I, I first off, I don't think. LeBron is the fourth member of Mount Rushmore. Like, I, 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 it's hard for me to say that he's the fourth one into it. Yeah. Like, somebody else needs to come off at this point because by the time his career is over, I yeah. think he's solidified in it and you're going to have to do a lot. Somebody else is going to have to do a lot to get there. But I do think if Steph beats him again, then Steph is entering that conversation of he needs as to As good as Steph is, don't you feel like he still kind of gets underrated? He does. No, he does. People and think he's a shooter. He ain't just a shooter. It's, yeah, no, it's, he's a, it's, it's so crazy. I think it's... I honestly think when you watch basketball, if you watch him play, as far as for offensive skill, dribbling, shooting, passing, all of that, him and then it's probably Kyrie is probably the most skilled basketball players I think I've ever seen. The the shots he takes in games, and you you literally sit there and you're like, ain't no way he just took that shot. Right. And they go in. Yeah. Like more often than not. And you start to sit there and you're like, bro, what what am I watching? This isn't you you can't coach these shots. Nobody takes these shots. And anybody else who does, you look at him like, "What are you doing?" He's a lot but more Steph, you're like, than people give him credit for. Oh, too. Maybe, yeah. And certain Jordan he's gotten there. He's gotten there through the back half of his career. Right, yeah. like he runs off screens. He's battling through stuff. I mean, you saw the video of him the other day driving through all the traffic. He got fouled by everybody. Who touched him. Yeah. Right, gets to the rim. Like he is not just a shooter. He's a. I think he's gonna go down as the greatest point guard of all time. He's a point guard. Yeah. I mean, tell me I'm wrong because of what he, the numbers he's putting up. You talk about how LeBron changed. Everybody wants to talk about generational guys. Everybody talks about MJ is MJ because he's six and six, in the, six for six in the finals, changed the way basketball was seen. Magic Johnson changed the way basketball was. LeBron James changed the way. Who's changed basketball more than Steph Curry? You go look at people like Steph showed you that the game can be played a different way, right? He's changed the way the game is being played now. He was kind of on the forefront of that, same as LeBron. So. As far as that goes, as far as you putting that on your resume, he's got that, right? He's got the rings. He's done everything that you want him to do. He's been, like, basically scandal-free. Like, nothing has, like, you never looked at him like, oh, this guy is a piece of shit. Like, no. So, I think he's going to go down as the greatest point guard of all time. I love Steph. Definitely think if he's not one, he's two. I don't even know who one would be. People sleep on Clay too. Yeah. I mean, I guess because yeah, Magic was a point guard, so I mean, I guess that. But like, how many how many titles did Magic win? Six. Did he win six? Four. Four or six. <laughs> I don't know. But the only thing that I would say that the reason that the Steph and LeBron conversation happens is because every time that Steph has ever got has gotten the better of LeBron is because he had a super team. And wait, Le- who's had a super team? Steph, when he, whenever they added Kevin Durant, at, yeah, yeah, you know, and it, yeah. so he doesn't get the credit for those championships because yeah. Kevin Durant gets the credit. He's never what they did last year cemented Steph's legacy because I, he did it on his own, but he didn't have to face he didn't his face him. He didn't big play bad him. wolf. I, and I will say this too, and I and I truly do believe this. Look, there's context to everything. I do think if you look through the course of a season, whatever it is, and then they get to those times they play him. I think every time that you've seen. The Lakers, not the Lakers, I'm sorry, LeBron's teams play Steph's teams. You've easily been like, I think Steph's teams is better, better. than LeBron's teams. Mm-hmm. And then they end up, you know, what the, the playoff record is what it is. So now we want to pose it as just head to head, basically. Right. Whatever, that is what yeah. it is. But it's, I mean, dude, what he's done, you can't knock the championships. Right. You can't knock the head to head numbers he's had against LeBron. So if you're I'm not going, saying he's better than LeBron. No, 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 no. So I'm saying if. This were to happen, and they won this one, and they win another title. I think he. I think he's argument, on the Mount Rushmore. And here's my argument to, oh, he has super teams. I get that, right? He has had super teams, but Kevin Durant has been on other super teams since. Going on right now, right? And like, those super teams don't always win. Why? 
because they don't mesh together. They don't have like you can't just put a bunch of talented guys in the room together and then be winners. Like they win, and so just because Steph played with Kevin Durant doesn't like you. They all had to work together and they all had their own reason for them winning. And so I like, can't just I wouldn't put it all on Kevin Durant winning. And obviously that helped, but Steph has won one without him, and Kevin Durant has not. Yeah, no, but that, that's still, the only reason I brought it up is because of what happened with the 3 right. one series where right. LeBron pretty much asserted his dominance over Steph, and that's all people think about is right. Steph had no help-ish, and LeBron had no help-ish, mm-hmm. and, and it showed who, like, LeBron went into fuck superhero sure. mode. absolutely. And so that's what people will always harken back to is with the 2016 Cavs team. So that's why I think that LeBron still holds, like, a little bit of if, that if, if, if Steph beats him this year, though, you have no excuse. Like you can't. They have no. You have no. You can't. Like if Steph beats them this year and they take, they win. The Lakers have a team that is pretty similarly talented to that to go to Golden State. If I mean, you see, have, but I, but here's the caveat though. Like the Lakers team completely changed at the at the right. at the but deadline. The, but the top two players are the same. Is my point. Like you had, but the team changed. Like there right. were so many guys right. that that came in that were new right. guys that are in the rotation. And my point is, and this is the same thing. Like if I looked at the whole year, I get it. The 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 Warriors sucked on the road this year. They hadn't played a lot, but you still always had those three guys that's been there forever and a lot of the same pieces. Whereas on LeBron's squad, right? No, I get it. Kind of didn't for sure, and that's what makes LeBron so great. Because every team you put LeBron on, they're an automatic NBA Finals contender. I'm not yeah. saying Steph is better than him. I'm no, just saying that if they if Steph wins this and they go win another title, like it's hard to argue. Steph's legacy in basketball. Yeah, I don't I think that, that you should argue it anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you shouldn't because even if they don't win, like he's got four titles and what is it about him that you think I don't people know. like don't I don't know. It's not like you knock him. You know exactly what you're gonna get, but for some reason he doesn't get acknowledged as a as like yeah. the he's, dude. He's never had that moment until I would say up until game seven against the Sacramento Kings where he's the first actually player. I think that I think you're actually right I think if you go look at his finals performance stats they're not I could be wrong now I no, could you're be not. wrong you're not but I, say, but I think they're not as like dominant Superhuman. yeah it's like you've seen them in other times they gave the MVP to Andre Iguodala yeah and Andre so, Iguodala was unbelievable in the finals LeBron averaged 38 like it was like he still did his thing they no, no. I just say, but that's what they gave it because like, oh, he locked down LeBron on defense. Like, not uh, really, but, but I mean, he did it all he could. Yeah, but I mean, that would have been a Steph MVP. But it's been those he dribbled it out of bounds in 2016 in Game Seven where he tries to throw it behind his back. Like, there's moments where people lock on to when you see Steph Curry where it's like this is a clutch moment where you need him, and he hasn't had that one shining moment. I guess you could say in like a Finals, he did it yeah. against. He's had regular season moments. You can think about like the double bang. He's had playoff moments too. Yeah, oh, yeah against yeah. the 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 Thunder when Mike Green's on the call and he pulls up from half court yep. and makes it. Best call in sports. Yep, Mike, of all time. The best. Mike Green. Yeah, his bang call is the yeah. best call in all of sports. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Joel Embiid got the won the MVP. He did. James Harden gave him a nice gift. What did he give him? A Strip Rolex. Club? Nice. Oh. Very oh, nice if you win MVP and your teammate says, here's, here's a Rolex. A Rolex. <laughs> um, Are those worth it? What, Rolexes? I don't have one. I don't have one. I couldn't tell you. They're expensive, eh? Yeah. yeah just a bit. You're from Canada, eh? Hey, I just heard that, you know, we sold watches back in the old jewelry days, and they said they keep the worst time of any they watch. They do, but it's, I mean, you, your value Status is symbol. And the value is not going to really... If you keep it out, the value is going to stay. You can resell it. Like yeah. It's, but, if you're um, reselling your watch, you're in a tough spot. Not if you not if you, not if you buy you, it for that much. Yeah, not if you buy it and you sell it for more and you just you know you won't buy another watch. That's what people do. Some people do anyway. Joel Embiid won the MVP. He was been banged up. After winning the MVP, he tells his team that he's back. So he's gonna be there. Philly's already up one nothing over the Celtics. He comes back for game two. Um, the craziest thing about the MVP voting is LeBron didn't get one vote, which I don't necessarily agree with. Like, how, not one. How do you not give him one vote? His numbers are the same as they're better than they were ever been when he won the MVP. And what, what was the last time? One, like 14? fourteen or something like that. That wasn't the last time he won the MVP. But no, but that like was that's just an MVP yeah, yeah. year. Yeah. So I don't know. Nuggets. LeBron James gets the the treatment. The for LeBron the MVP, James treatment. Yeah. Whereas, the same treatment that Mike Trout gets in baseball. Mm-hmm. Just the treatment where it's dude, you've been so good for so long. We're so bored. Yep. We want we want something else that can excite us because we know what we're getting out of you. No doubt. He hasn't won MVP since twenty thirteen. 
2013. Which is criminal. <laughs> <laughs> really think about that. That's crazy. And Giannis, and Giannis, I would say Giannis from, gets bounced in the first round. I would say from 14 to probably... 2023. No, no, I'd say 14 to probably, like, legit. 1920-ish, it was still pretty much... This is the best player in the game, mm-hmm. it, but we we still don't have an MVP on there. No, right? Way. We gotta give somebody. You gotta get the league excited <laughs> about something. I mean, Jokic has it two years in a row. I mean, look, Jokic's numbers could good. have could have very well won it this year yeah. too. Yeah, and they're two and zero. Oh. They uh, are. They look good. Yep, they look really good. Um, sneaky good team. If, I don't know uh, if they're sneaky. I don't know if they're sneaky. No, but what good it depends team. on the health of the cat from that always has the back injuries that didn't play a lot in college. Played one year. Um, they drafted him in the first round. Uh, Porter. Porter. If Michael, Michael Porter, Porter Jr. can play, yeah. that is... Speaking of, if you go back to it, who was the... Who Chris was that? Paul got hurt again. What was the team that Anthony Davis was on in college? Who was on that team? Devin Booker. And? and De'Aaron Fox. No. Malik Monk. Um, was he on that team? No. I'm pretty not. sure it was... Booker for I think sure it was, came off the bench. I think it was... No, Booker was a starter. No, he came off the bench. Booker was 100% a starter in college. Because I remember watching him so much being like he's he was on the same team with Jamal Murray. And I was like, he's the better player. Booker is 100% a starter in college. I agree with you there. Maybe not his freshman year. Or was it one of the year that they were unbelievable? He was 100% a starter that year. 100%. I'll bet you. Are you looking it up? Yeah, Yeah, I already, already know. That Pull he wasn't. Okay. He, what year? he was a six man. What year? Pull it up. His freshman year, maybe. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But the next year, he wasn't a one and done. Was he? I don't think he was a one and done. Are you, he had Carl Anthony Towns, Devin Booker. He averaged 10 points a game. Aaron Harrison. Tyler Eulis. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and they, they, lost, they went undefeated, and then they lost in the championship. But how many years was he at? Uh, how many years was he there? Devin Booker. Oh, played. only one year? Only one year, and he came yeah. off the bench. Well. Sorry about it. But I do I do agree with you. When I watched him play, especially when he came here, I was in the game, and I was like, this guy is uh, – he's my favorite player to watch on the team. He's smooth. He's, obviously, he can shoot. He's really good. Um, Big that team, team was nasty. chemistry guy. LSU beat that team. Was that that game? I think that was the ice game. Remember when mm-hmm. the whole – it was? I think LSU beat Kentucky twice that year. They definitely beat him at the PMAC because everybody yeah. was cutting donuts. It was awesome. And you couldn't get over the train tracks to go to Tigerland. Everybody was slipping and falling. Yeah. It was electric. Yeah. We used to, we watched, we parked, and I watched people just fall. Yeah, so we did that did the same thing. It. We were living two different lives at the same time. Um, All right. Well. Lloyd was right. He came off the bench. No game started that year, but he averaged four less minutes a game than everybody. Yeah, so right, right. He played. He was a starter. We're just not that starting. Yeah, for exactly. sure. Six man, he was good, very good. They all they had a bunch of NBA guys on that team. Like the the top the top guy on that team averaged twenty five point nine minutes a game. That was Willie Cauley Stein, and Devin Booker averaged twenty one point five. Yeah, but he came off the bench. I I, I know. I'm saying he said that. I literally just gave you your props, dude. Like, <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> Lord. it. Lord. Um. All right, Lord, it's your it's your time. It's your, your day. Time to shine. Your time to shine. Let's see what we have today for. Dozy deep place mistake of the day. I have one. I feel like we touched on it a little bit, but I would be remiss if I did not mention the fact that there was no way to watch LSU baseball yesterday. I've been in those situations before as somebody that's run production, but I cannot... Not ESPN's fault. Not ESPN's fault. That's what okay. I'm saying. But Southeastern, from what we heard, they have students run their production team, and they're definitely... 100% out of their depth and didn't know what to do, had no Wi-Fi in the stadium, and as a man that is a devout follower of Cajunomics, You're he tried bummed. He tried his best. He put up a full screen of every other game that was going on and then had the LSU radio call going. So almost a little bit of a curtain call to Cajunomics for still trying to get you your content, but the fact I just feel for the people, for the Doge mistake of the day at Southeastern, that definitely were tasked with an event far too large for them mm-hmm. because I've had something at Northwestern where my boss asked me to wake up at 4 a.m. to go film the president run. So was he not your boss? Oh, he was. So why did you get the quotes around Because I didn't go. Okay. I just did. Yeah, I mean, at 4 a.m. in the rain to go you watch the, the thing. Yeah, to go watch the <laughs> president run. He's like, go film it on your phone. And I was like, nobody needs to see that. 
And what did he say after you didn't do that? Did you get fired? He texted me at 11, and I told him I was asleep. I mean, that's way too late. If I have to wake up at 4, he should have let me know earlier. Mm. So I feel like it was fair game. What did he say? He threw a fit. Of course. It's okay. All right. We got through it. Let's take it today. Brought to you by Doze <laughs> Place. If you haven't been to Doze, go check them out. Great, great, great burgers for lunch. And uh, But imagine steaks. how much revenue was lost for South, uh, for Southeastern. Like, you planned that whole event to be able to get... Do you TV. lose a bunch of revenue if the game's... Oh, off? you don't get any TV shares. Oh, uh, that's right. That's right. <clears throat> no, they don't get any TV money, no commercial money, and that was their... The like, carrot. That, yes. Yeah, that was the their one. honey hole that's the for one. the entire baseball season, and you get zip zero nada. Yeah, and you got nada on the field. And you lose. Literally. No, literally nada. Like nada. Zero. Not one run. T- none. <laughs> Touching it to Tough. bat was the only time you touched Tough. it. Tough. Tough. Um, all right. Curtain calls brought to you by our friends down at Assured Partners. And me. Okay. What you got, Jay? Um, my curtain call is to a football family. Um, one that experienced the NFL draft this past weekend. The kid ended up still getting drafted to I, awesome. as crazy as it th- as crazy it is Nepotism. to the the team that his dad was most notable playing for. But a hot mic, I think it was, kind of caught they the dad speaking to the player. son after he did me. not go in the first round, which he showed up at the draft. Now, follow me. And I my say, curtain call goes well, to the dad say, because well, be me that's pretty awesome. I feel like I don't know. I'm not a dad myself, but I feel like as kids grow, you get certain opportunities. You know where you're supposed to win. Your dad and kind of bring them back in. got control over That's why I'm trying to prepare you for anything because I already know anything can happen. See how I know how, they, how, how great of a relationship they have right here, so it's pretty cool to see this. That was motivation, right? right. They, want they want to see a pissed off football, football player. player. Now, now they got, they got one. one. You see what I'm saying? So, so now follow me when I say, when, when, when I say, when I be giving you little nuggets about what we got to do and how we got to work, just follow me because this is what we part of the whole operation now. Because you know what you're supposed to win. And all that. We ain't got control over it. That's why I'm trying to prepare you for anything. Because I already know anything can happen. I know how the drives go. But what I'm telling you is, now you've been motivated to another level. Because we got some proof. Yeah. Hell yeah. And, and, and take it personally, as you should. Love okay. But you ain't did nothing. You know what I'm saying? You gave me you gave me you're supposed to do. No, this is, you, ain't, you ain't letting nobody down here. Love that. Love it. Love that because it's so relatable. Like you can't control that. You can do everything you can do to put yourself in a position to get taken where you should. You think you should get taken, but at the end of the day, the it draft is really crazy, matter. man. And, it, and it's in every sport. The draft is yep. crazy. Yep, that's awesome. That's so. the beauty of having a guy, a dad that's he's gonna fit through just it. fine. Oh, he's Pittsburgh. gonna have a great time. You Not did. even a great time. Um, he's Mike, have a great Mike career. Mike Tom was probably like, oh, you they know. couldn't wait oh, till he got her. He came God. around in the second yeah. round. Yeah. Yep. No I doubt. You had a little different. Draft speech. Me, yeah, yeah. Mine wasn't more of a speech. It was just, uh, let's just cut. Let's cut the tension here. <laughs> let's cut the tension. In the grandma, room. old grandma. She did. Grandmas it. don't lie. They don't. Uh, they, they say what they want. She did it. She's been reading Keith Law. Got everybody. Got everybody. Uh, Chuckling. Everybody laughing. So it was good. Uh, all right. Did you curtain call? Did you laugh? I did. You have to. Mm-hmm. My curtain call is finally we got the culprit. The bad man is gone. Jackson Mahomes arrested. Charged with aggravated sexual battery. Jesus, that's aggressive. And I didn't do it. He did. $100,000 bond at 8.42 Eastern Time on Wednesday. He's been charged with three counts of aggravated sexual battery. An additional fourth count for probably just being who he is. Um, He had a brief court appearance on Zoom. Surprised he didn't do it on TikTok. But... Jackson Mahomes hopefully is out of our lives forever and serves oh, a long come on, time in prison. Come on, come He's on. a bad person, and we all could smell it and see it. Easy. And poor Patrick Mahomes having to deal with this because I'm sure he got the call to bail him out. Easy. Take Brittany next. Easy. Relax. Relax. You don't ever want to say that about somebody. Look, innocent, allegedly innocent and proven to, until proven guilty. Oh, he's been guilty. Allegedly, of a lot of things. You know, let's let the law. Finally, let's a let the, crime. Let's let the court make the decision. 
Um, you know, maybe this will bring him back down to earth. Maybe this will say, you got to figure out, like, you got to figure out your life. You know, you're not your brother. Stop living off your brother's coattails. You're trying to do all these different things. So I might love jail. Um, Jesus Christ. All right. That's yours. My. <laughs> what? I oh, know. My curtain call. Don't put the camera to, on me now. <laughs> is to our friend, guy who played baseball here at LSU, who was a starter, had a really good career at LSU, Alex Lang. Alex Lang uh, got drafted by the Cubs <clears throat> as a starter, got moved to the bullpen. Um, now he is with the Tigers and he is thriving in the bullpen. My current call is to him because his last 10 outings have been pretty impressive. Over his last 10 outings, he has 10 innings pitched. He has given up zero Sit runs. He has All a, game for yeah, Lang and the Tigers. Uh, what a nice comeback win. Huh? Wow. And, it stayed with that uh, curveball. That gets that bat that out there. Nasty. Tigers win it. That's the way to start. A double call. header Short Wednesday. Call. Omar Vizquel. That is the uh, yeah, sits the him down. Ball game for Lang He's and the Tigers. What a nice comeback right win! Now. Wow, it stayed with that curveball. Gets that bat out there. Tigers win it. That's the way to start. Yes, he hit their first home run of the year. Javi Baez. Yeah, I saw that. Long time. God, missed that man. Do you though? No, He's maybe He's batting three. He's batting three forty. Okay, he got there you go. Maybe he figured it out. Maybe he figured it out. Omaga. Um. All right. Another good show today. We will be back live in studio on Friday from 1 to 3 p.m. A lot of whims today. What? Jay Johnson gets a microphone. Jay yep. Johnson gets on the show. Mm -hmm. I feel like we touched on some things nobody else touched on. Mm -hmm. Did we? I'm glad. That was always a goal. It's the goal. I hope. I hope they like it. Um, Just under 100. Some guy gave me a high five to the other day going into, coming out of the grocery store and then proceeded to tweet and tag me. I was like, oh, that's good. Uh, speaking <laughs> of Twitter, watch out. No, we said we weren't doing that. So we weren't doing that. Don't I'm give not it. Mad. I'm Don't give it. Don't give in. Lloyd's mad that we didn't entertain it when it was happening, even though it was not worth entertaining. I'm not talking just, about this clown. No. Right. No talking about it. Um, if you can't, if you liked watching our show, please like and subscribe. We just got to the four thousand mark on Twitter subscribers. That's great. I mean, on, on uh, YouTube. Four thousand more than NFLSU on Twitter. Underscore underscore. Here we go. See, he did it anyway. Bro. He did anyway. I mean, Jesus um, Christ. 5,000 is the next benchmark. Up, Please Stop. like and subscribe to our YouTube page. Stop. Stop. Um, share it with other people. Tell people that you liked our baseball content. Our content in general, because we do more than just baseball right now. It is baseball, but we're going to do more as we progress throughout the course of the seasons. <laughs> um, if you can't watch us, please, and you have to listen to us because you're driving or you're working or you're doing whatever, please, uh, we're anywhere you get your podcast. So please tune in there. Subscribe there. Um, We'll be get. We'll be live again from studio from one to three p.m. Um, this Friday. Yes. New graphics soon come. What for the ticker? Maybe. Oh yeah. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. Soon. 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 We get new sponsors. Maybe you. Investors. Possibly maybe. You. Possibly you. Um, that's it. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy the rest of your hump day. We appreciate you tuning in. We appreciate you supporting us. Please continue to support us. Uh, we'll see you on Friday. See you. Peace. <laughs>